Come Holy Spirit. Let's share in our scripture today from the book of Acts chapter 2 beginning with the first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with that Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and all the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. It's Pentecost Sunday. And it's a time in which we celebrate that third person of the Trinity. We think about the church and its inauguration, if you will, into the welcoming of God's Holy Spirit. And we reference it today in our experiences in different ways. But if you stop and think, we've already encountered God, the Creator. And we've encountered Jesus, the Savior of our world. The one who brought us our, our, sacri- our uh, salvation. And then we come to an understanding now of the Holy Spirit as the Comforter. The one who will lead us forward into the life and relationship as Christian disciples. You can go back to John chapter 14 where Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples celebrating that Passover meal. And in the course of that meal, he begins to talk about the fact that he's going to depart from them. They will no longer see him, he says. But one will come after me, the comforter, who will explain all these things to you and and remind you of all these things so that you can move forward and you will be able to do greater things than I. And later on then when the resurrected Christ appears and he journeys and begins to reveal himself to his people, he reaches a place where he then comes to an ascension where he will return to heaven. And in those moments he tells his disciples, you got to wait here. I'm leaving you, but remember there's still more to come. And if you will wait, God will provide. He offers them the commission of what they're to do, but he tells them, you can't do this alone. You need the Spirit. And so he sets the stage for all of this to happen that we see in Acts chapter 2. I remember um, 18 years old, my first year in college, my mother and I decided to go visit a sister in Kansas City. And we went to Dallas and we boarded my first plane flight, a Braniff Airlines flight to Kansas City from Dallas. I was already a little bit nervous, and I'm sitting in the middle seat of three. My mother's sitting in the aisle seat, of course, and there's another lady sitting over here to my left that I've never met before in my life. My mother reaches across, and she says, hi, and she introduces herself, and the lady responds, and then she says, this is my son, Ricky. He's a pastor. And then she moves back to her seat and starts going on with her life, and meanwhile, I'm left here as a pastor, and this lady has questions. And I remember, she, oh, a pastor. Well, she started asking some tough questions. One of her questions was, are you spirit-filled? And I'm like, 
Yeah, and I'm kind of like uh, spirit-filled. Well, yeah, yeah, I think I am. And, and she said, are you Holy Ghost-filled? As far as I know, I am. Yes, ma'am. And she says, well, are you a gospel preacher? And I said, yes, ma'am. I use all four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I thought that was the right answer. I would love to go back to that point now and be able to answer those questions a little more. Because now I understand what they mean. When I know what she was after in those questions. And we do have those questions sometimes with people. We want to discern and know, are they really of God? Are you really filled with God's Spirit? And it's a question we ask, but sometimes we don't always get straight answers because we mean different things with that question. Are you Spirit-filled? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? It's a question that has been going on ever since this experience at Pentecost. Pentecost, by the way, is the 50 days since Passover. It's used as a festival of the Jewish calendar where 50 days after the Passover, the people then are again called back to Jerusalem for a celebration. It's really tied to the harvest experiences because if you want to know what it really was, it was a farmer's market. Okay, People brought their fruits and their vegetables and all the harvest from their fields and they gave their offerings to God but on the side over here they were making exchange and making a little living and doing some provision. And so everybody came, not so much for the sacred part of it but certainly for the harvest part of it. And so the conversations and all the things that took place, the people, if you remember Jesus clearing the temple, everything's kind of restored now back to the, the activity of the financials and the exchange and the worship's a little bit more neglected. And so the disciples are following their requirement from Jesus to pray and wait for the Spirit. And they are there at the temple, they're there in that Spirit on that harvest experience, but they're there for prayer. They've already taken care of their business. If you look at Luke's account in Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 15, what you find is that the disciples have already done their gathering prior to this. They have brought together all the people who were followers of Jesus at this point, and their numbers are somewhere around 120. Luke points this out to us for significant reasons. He wants us to know that that Jewish requirement of 120 people has been met with this group, and that's how you establish an official meeting that does the work of God. If it's less than that, then it's not really a full meeting. It's not a, God hasn't ordained it. But if it's 120, for some reason that was a significant number to the Jewish community, then, then you have the required uh, quota to have your meeting. So the disciples, Luke tells us, are gathered. They have their 120 and they begin the work of the church, which is to replace the disciple who is left. That's Judas. And so they cast lots, do nominations, they decide and they elect Matthias as the disciple to replace Judas. That's the business of the church. And now they move into the prayer time, the worship time, where they then as a quorum can meet and worship for God's purpose and they are seeking God's spirit as they've been told. And that's when this story begins. It's the context, if you will. Now, I pause here to tell you this. If you want to know one of the secrets about the Holy Spirit in your life and relationship with Jesus Christ, it's this. It's not an isolated experience like we sometimes say it is. And that's why we really shouldn't be asking the question, are you spirit-filled? The real question is, are we spirit-filled? Because it's about community. The Spirit is drawn to a community, 120 or more. The required quota is met. The Spirit is drawn and comes at that time. It doesn't go, here, I'll get you now, I'll get you now, I'll get you now. It comes as a wind, and it lands as tongues of fire on each of their heads, and it embraces the community as a whole. Everybody's witnessing it and experiencing it. The Holy Spirit is really a community experience, and sometimes we forget that. Now, I'm not looking at the attendance numbers just yet. But I believe that today we don't have to have 120 necessarily. But I think when God's people are brought together, we sense a, a revealed and an openness that we need to the Holy Spirit. We can light our candles because we know as a community we're drawn together by God. And His Spirit will come to His people when two or more are gathered in His name. And so, one of the nature, that, part of the nature of the Holy Spirit here is that it's drawn to the community of God's people, the connection. And then it has a purpose in it, and that's to unify us. When we're divided, 
whether it's our opinions about carpet or anything else, as a community of people, as the body of Christ, we are less open to God's Spirit at work. But when we are united, the Spirit becomes stronger. And what we discover is that the Spirit comes to the community, and then it pulls us together and unites us in the pew. And it unites us around the work of God, and it starts bringing us to the mission of what we're to be about to change our world. But let me go back to the story. The disciples are gathered, they're connected, and the Spirit comes. And it brings to them this gift of speaking in a language that's not their own. Now, I pause here to tell you that some people will tell you out there it's about speaking in tongues. That's what this story's about. If you read it carefully and look, it doesn't mention speaking in tongues here. It does mention speaking in tongues later on when we talk about the fruits of the Spirit and we talk about the, the gifts of the Spirit that people have as the body of Christ. That's a whole other conversation to have. What I want you to hear here is that it's not a requirement. It's not mentioned here. But what it does say is that in that moment, the Spirit came to the disciples and they spoke in a different language. It was a language that wasn't their own. And yet it was understood by someone in their midst. It wasn't just a random language that no one knows to show that they had God's Spirit, which is how we truly use it sometimes. We try to establish a priority and, and a ranking in our community of faith because this person has the gift of the Spirit, this person doesn't. Some say, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost, and that's not true. What's happening here is all the disciples are given this gift to, to help um, express that the Spirit is in their midst. But the Spirit is working through them to do something powerful that has a deeper purpose. It's never wasted. What's happening here is they're speaking in a language that's not their own. They haven't learned it. They wouldn't know it. They couldn't do it on their own. But it's happening. I don't know about you, but it would be pretty awesome if I said, you know, let's read the scripture together in unison. And we stood up and everybody in the room spoke a different language. I mean, it would be like chaos here, wouldn't it? And it gets somebody's attention. And if all of us were from different places, let's say, and we didn't speak a common language, but yet we stood to read the scripture and suddenly someone in the room spoke your language to you and you heard the scripture in your language, but you were speaking in a language that wasn't your own so that someone else could hear this scripture, wouldn't that be a crazy thing? It's happened one time in our history, and that was Pentecost experience for the, for the early church. Yet it happened, and that was the manifestation of the Spirit. It came, and it made itself known by this simple act. But what you see in the passage also now is that there are those who were outside the circle that were more busy doing the exchange probably and the other things. They didn't notice the disciples in the corner praying. But suddenly some attention is drawn to what they're hearing. Because now I'm hearing something in my language that I didn't even know. How are, and so they're drawn to, the, the, the outside is drawn to the circle. Isn't it wonderful when God's Spirit embraces a community and suddenly wakes up outside our circle and our walls and says, y'all need to come see this. We used to call it camp meetings and revival and the ways that the Spirit would do that for us. And, and we've kind of lost that feeling sometimes because a lot of times people outside these walls don't even know what's happening here on Sunday morning. But the truth is, in this moment, what's happening is drawing the people in, and they're drawn to it, and they're asking themselves, what's going on here? And they're trying to figure it out in their head, and it's not happening. How is it that these Galileans can speak my language? I know that they haven't been trained to do this, and yet I'm hearing so clearly, how is this happening? And then there are those who are suspect over here a little bit, and they make a joke. Uh, they're probably drunk. I mean, my guess, too much wine. Well, I don't think even wine can do that, do you? And so they're, they're, they're led to an understanding that the Spirit is in their midst and they're discovering it as well when they were on the outside to begin with. And I think God can do that. He can bring people into our story, into our experience that want to know what's going on here. I want what you have. <laughs> it looks exciting. It looks powerful. You seem to be changed by it. I want to be changed by it. And we're, they're drawn to it and attracted to it. Now, I love what Peter does here. Peter gets up in this moment and speaks to that because he hears the, the discussion about the wine probably. He says, you know, some clarification probably needs to be happening here for a little bit. There's a lot of people confused in the room right now. And so he begins to speak for them the prophecy of Joel, but he does it in a context that first clarifies that what they're seeing is not a mistake. It's God at work. 
and I love the words he uses here. You notice he doesn't say, not the disciples, they don't drink. He says, dear friends, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay? They're not drunk. And then I feel this pause there where he's kind of like, maybe in the back of his mind he's saying, come back later in the day and you'll see them, who knows. But he's, he's setting the stage here for them to know this is not what you think it is. It is God at work. And let me explain it to you. The prophecy of Joel would point this out to you. And he quotes to them the prophecy of Joel, which clearly says that when God decides, God decides. You ever heard that song, when the Spirit says, sing, I'm going to sing? When the Spirit says dance, I'm going to dance. When the Spirit says pray, I'm going to pray. When the Spirit says preach, I'm going to preach. Oh, buddy, when the Spirit decides, the Spirit decides. And that's what, Paul, I mean, that's what Peter's really saying here. He's saying, you know what? This is not even us. All I got to tell you is that God decided this was the time, this was the place, and it's for his purpose. And it comes to one point, and that is this. If anyone confesses with their mouth, they will be changed. It's contagious, folks. Get ready. It's contagious. And I think the church has a wonderful message here and a wonderful history. But what I want you to hear me say is maybe we're not really embracing the fullness of God's Holy Spirit. Because the truth is, it's here in our community. If we just simply invoke it and ask for it, God provides. His Spirit is available to us. And it can do some powerful things, things that you and I can't do on our own. But it will always be done with God's purpose at hand. And it will always be about growing the relationships that he wants with all of his people, including us and those beyond these walls today. The truth is, when you invoke the Holy Spirit and it enters your life and your experience, you are changed. You are made different. You are a new creation, as Paul puts it later on for us. You are made different. Somewhere out there, people need to be looking at you and saying, you're different. Something's different about you. I don't understand. You're not the same person you were. And now you're changed. And it ought to make them ask some questions and wonder about us. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. And I pray this, I do, I pray this, that somewhere along the way we're seeing this self, ourselves changed enough that when we come into a worship experience and we come to that moment in which we embrace the Holy Spirit, we're talking about a changed heart, a changed spirit, and we have a soul on fire that needs to find an expression somewhere. John Wesley uh, was quoted as saying, a catch on fire with enthusiasm and people will come from miles to watch you burn. Because they're drawn to that. People want that. They want an enthusiasm. They want an energy. They want a celebration. They want joy. And you and I have access to it. In the God's Holy Spirit today, we're no longer a people who are living with a Savior that died, was resurrected, and now gone to heaven. It's Jesus in our midst today because of the Holy Spirit. And that power is just as available today and more so than it's ever been. And the church struggles and what it can do with the Holy Spirit. We have to ask questions about it. You don't know how many times this week I've been asked, what's Pentecost? Oh, nothing, just the birth of the church. <laughs> the invoking of the Holy Spirit that made all the difference for us and changes us then and changes us now. So I go back to that question of that lady on that airplane. And I think I understand now that what she really was asking me was, Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit? And she meant it in a very personal way. As a pastor, do you have the Holy Spirit? Are you ready for what God can do in you? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? I'm looking and I want some evidence for that. I want to see the Holy Spirit in you. That's what she was asking me. That's what she was looking for. And I was just 18 years old and didn't even understand the question. But I've lived enough life now and I've experienced enough with this Holy Spirit in my own life that I would love to go back in time there and sit down beside her again and say, you know what the question really is? Does the Holy Spirit have me? Because the truth is, if I'm not letting the Holy Spirit do what it can in my life, I'm wasting your time and my time too. The day I tell you I have the Holy Spirit, you, sh you should not even be asking that question. You should be able to see it and the Holy Spirit should have me enough that you know it before you even ask. There's the problem. 
And my goal would be to become a person that I can sit here in my life and say the Holy Spirit has me. Friends, that's the question we've got to ask today. Does the Holy Spirit have you? I'm not going to question whether God's Spirit is here. I'm not going to question whether it's possible. I'm not going to question whether or not you're qualified or I'm qualified or what the gift may look like and how it may come out and be evident in you. But I will ask this, does the Holy Spirit have you? And that's, that's where we need to be. And to this Pentecost Sunday, I'm asking you to answer that question. I'm asking you to hear that question and to find your answer. And if it's right now that you don't know, you're not sure, you're un, you, you need to, maybe you need to get to your knees today and say, God, I do want you to bring your spirit in my life and make a difference. I want to leave here differently than, when we came, than the way I came. I'd love it if I walked out that door and someone said to me, what's wrong with you? You must have been to church. What a glorious day it would be in the life of the church when the community of God, every God's child, can be available to God's Holy Spirit and what's really possible in his work. Jesus said, go and make disciples for the transformation of the world. And the only way we can do it is when, when the Holy Spirit has us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.